Uh, the, today's comic will come as no surprise if you watched yesterday's unboxing video. Which, by the way, one of my least favourite videos I have ever done. I hated that one. This is Defenders 120. The first part of a two-part story called Sanctuary. Which I mentioned in that unboxing video. We will come back to this cover right at the end. And I will point out the problem with it. But our story is mostly great. It is one that I like, but also one that I have a few nitpicks with, at least in execution. Satan's son has gone on a soul-searching pilgrimage. And you could definitely do some sort of a pun based on this character, soul-searching. This has brought him to a monastery... A monastery that he spent time at in the past, trying to control his dark side. What has brought him on this journey is that he has fallen in love, but he feels that all he will do is corrupt her, or she will be a victim for his dark side. So he has come back to the monastery to try and sort himself out and learn is this satanic monster all that I can ever be? Please help me, father. This story arc has always had a place in my art as not only does it have some nice character exploration with Satan's son. But as I also said yesterday. Defenders issue 122. It was the first issue of Defenders I read. And that one opens with. Two pages of aftermath of this story. And honestly. Those two pages were my favourite part of that issue. It let me know something big had just happened. It had a nice romance bit. I didn't understand any of it really. But that was the appeal. I was thrown in at the deep end. But as I have said before. It is bloody nice being thrown in at the deep end. And then going back to track down those hard issues. To fill in the gap. It's like the story has instant investment with you Even though you know how it ends You want to know how it gets there It is already built up in your head And it probably has a lot more effect that way Than just reading all the series in order Satan's son, he stays at the monastery again, open to come to terms with himself or decide what he should do. While there, he befriends or he meets an unusual chap. And I say unusual, not just because he has a giant ball patch at the front of his head in this scene and then none in any other scenes. I say unusual because this is Miracle Man, former loser Fantastic Force bad guy, whose history I went over yesterday, but I did overlook his appearance in Marvel 2 for 1 issue 8. Genuinely, I had no recollection of it. He has come to stay at the monastery... Seemingly for honest and sincere reasons. Maybe. Meanwhile, we have a few scenes this issue cutting away to the rest of the Defenders. And they are what I would criticise about the writing. There are some real redundancies here. And they only needed 
the one scene instead of three. The next scene we have with them. It relays all the information from this one too. The car, aka Kate left. She wakes up from a nightmare. She has sensed evil is coming for Satan's son. Totally useless scene. Especially when you see how quick we get to the second one. Which repeats this information. We have a bit with Satan's son being warned about Miracle Man. And then straight after that, a single page, we have another scene with the team. They are working out in a gym and Kate Leff mentions how she keeps having dreams about Satan's son being in danger. That is all that was needed. Then we have a fun bit with Velcro. Some comic relief with some alpha male chads thinking that Velcro is weak because she is a little girl. Then, one night, Satan's son discovers Miracle Man, now without bald patch, doing some sort of arcane ritual when everybody else is asleep. Satan's son sees a kindred spirit, someone battling with supernatural inner demons. And I am ganning to perhaps gan on my most ambitious character history lesson yet. Satan's son first appeared in Ghost Driver number one from 1973. It was actually the very first thing we saw in that issue too. He was created by Gary Ghostdriver and in that first appearance he was an expert exorcist who was called in to deal with the possession of a Native American woman called Linda Little Trees. If that is right, please give this video a like. In the second and third issues, we get to see a lot more of Satan's son, and we learn what his deal is. He is the son of Satan, who rejects his father, and is constantly battling with his own urges to be like his dad. He then took over Ghost Driver's spot, headlining Marvel Spotlight. And he was the star of that series for about 12 issues. I really enjoyed the ones by Steve Gerbel. I think he better streamlined and used the character to his full potential. Eventually, Satan's son graduated to his own series. But the sad news is that it wasn't very good. Steve Gerbel was gone. And the first issue starts promisingly enough. But it's downhill from there. The series was cancelled with issue 8. Notable for also being censored. This original page here... Depicting Satan's son being crucified was never printed and it was replaced with a new page that doesn't make any sense. The life and times of Satan's son didn't end there because Steve Gerbel was quick to include the character in Defenders. Starting with Giant Size Defenders number 2. Doctor Strange sought out Satan's son to help the team battle an evil demon. Some pretty great Jill Kang art in that one. 
After that, he made sporadic appearances in Steve Gerbel's run. Most memorably, being called to help the team fight the KKK. And later, trying to help them do an exorcism on Batman. When Steve Gerbel left the title, Satan's son seemed to vanish too. Although he did appear alongside the team during... The Defenders for a Day debacle. He returned to the team full time at the start of Jim Tomatis' run and he became a main featured character. A relationship quickly developed between him and Kate Leff, which leads us to where we are now. And here is another pointless scene. This is here to establish that Kate Left's dreams are actually more than just dreams. They are the result of her dormant psychic powers, giving her a premonition or vision. Here, she knocks Dr. Bedlam on his arse as proof of... Her mental abilities. So the team. They set off. To track down Satan's son. And Miracle Man. Exposes himself. But not in that way. Thankfully. He has felt the great power. Lurking within Satan's son. And now. He wants it for himself. I do like that Jim Tomatoes, the writer of this, he does address and make reference to all of Miracle Man's past appearances and uses them to explain how we got to the point where he is studying in a monastery. A fight between Satan's son and Miracle Man breaks out. Another little problem I have is that Miracle Man's powers are not or have never been explained well. Like here, he displays some telekinetic ability and then he can also transform the monks into stone. So the fight... The fight doesn't go well for Satan's son and Miracle Man defeats him and then absorbs all of Satan's son's evil demonic energies. And now let us look at the cover again and witness that the figure who would appear to be Miracle Man is completely bald. It is kind of like he had an air transplant over the course of the issue. In part two, I will get into why I like Satan's son and hopefully be able to do so, much like this video, without talk of the elephant in the room and how this is maybe the first character Marvel truly obliterated with destructive writing. I will give this issue... Well, if man is five, then the devil is six. And if the devil is six, then I am seven thumbs up.